So hello, we have Dr. David Lay here in the flesh. Thanks so much for being here and answering some questions. Uh, the first question is, what were your main impressions of this recent ASEC summaries too? Um, yeah, I think I was really, really pleased that it happened. Um, if you'd asked me four years ago when I first published the book, The Myth of Sex Addiction, um, I wouldn't have believed that ASEC would gather together, you know, 50 therapists from around the country, around the world, in fact, there were uh, folks from New Zealand there, to find ways to move forward, to, to come up with a new direction. Um, you know, I think the main kind of impression I had was just people recognizing that it's time to come up with some different alternatives and that the old ways of doing this and addressing these issues weren't working. Um, and that there were enough people now and enough institutional recognition uh, that they brought this in, that they brought this this gathering together. I thought it was really powerful. I started from uh, kind of an interesting and, and perhaps surprising um, strategy in terms of saying that in order to move forward and do so successfully, that ASEC therapists needed to understand and think about why the sex addiction model had been successful. That we had had to recognize that the sex addiction model had been something very useful, something that fit the time and that served some purposes. I think we needed to look at what it was in the sex addiction kind of uh, approach that people grabbed onto and that people used and benefited from. So in that, you know, I then invited people to think about ways in which, for instance, um, the sex addiction model was uh, more accessible to be to the general public because the sex addiction model uses anecdotes more than data, uses, you know, people's stories rather than research. And I, and, and I invited therapists to think about how they can take that um, and now instead of talking to the general public, research, let's start talking about stories. Let's start talking about people's lives who are getting better and moving forward and making different uh, decisions about sexual behaviors without invoking the sex addiction model. Instead of saying that the theory and the research behind sex addiction is poor, let's start, let's start talking about stories of people. Um, number two, I invited people to recognize that the sex addiction model is something that has been more accessible um, for folks with conservative and more religious values. Um, you know, I, I polled the audience at, at ASEC, and like almost every audience that I present to on these issues, it was predominantly a liberal and largely non-religious audience. Um, now, what that means is that the folks out there who are conservative and are more religious in values are not hearing these messages. They are more often hearing messages around sex addiction. And so one of the messages there is that to be successful, we need to find a way to bridge that gap. We need to find a way that we can offer this information, these new approaches, these, this new kind of conception around sexual behavior problems. Um, to the audience that right now we're not reaching, which is those conservative religious folks. Now, the, the you know, a really important, I think, piece of information right now is that you know, there's a lot of research um, acknowledging that it is folks with greater religious values around sex who are the ones who are struggling most with pornography issues, for instance. And that, um, you know, the sex addiction model was born out of the crisis around AIDS and people struggling with fear around sexual behavior problems related to exposure to AIDS. Now people are struggling with the conflict between the you know, access to sexual information available on the internet through pornography, conflicting with the religious values that they were taught and that they've never adequately examined. We as clinicians can again ignore that issue the way that we did in the 1980s with AIDS. Um, and, and if we do, we shouldn't be surprised that the sex addiction model holds on. Um, instead, I think that, you know, what, what, what Doug, Michael, with their book, um, out of, Treating Out of Control Sexual Behavior, and what the ASEC Summer Institute really focused on was 
we need to help people invoke and move from a place of sexual wellness, identifying and understanding what sexual health is in their understandings so that they can now try to define and manage their behaviors, not from a place of arbitrary external control. You should do that or you should do that. Instead, you should only do that if you can do so in a healthy, ethical manner from a place of personal integrity. And I think that changes the dialogue. And I also think that is one that can be more accessible um, to folks from a conservative and religious background, because what we're saying is we want to help you define your sexual behaviors and your sexual values consistent with your personal religious and political values. We want to help you integrate and bring all of this stuff together in a synthesized kind of way. Um, that, I think, is something therapists can be really helpful with when we look at it in this kind of way. Um, that, in a, in a nutshell, I think that was the synthesis that I really invited people to find ways to move forward with. How to take um, the success of the sex addiction model, how to bring a sexual wellness kind of perspective in, and how to now find ways that we can provide that information in a useful, accessible, engaging way to the public that strikes their intuition and gives them something that they can connect with and understand, as opposed to, you know, scientists and doctors saying, well, this is what the research shows. Um, we need to find ways to go around that um, and go around that resistance and defensiveness and invite people then to think, this is how I want to be, and now here is how I can make changes in my life to get there. I mean, that seems, the point that stuck out to me the most, just because of my business background, is that the sex addiction model really is marketing. It's really strong marketing. They pull into the stories, mm -hmm. they pull into, um, you know, what's driving people to mm -hmm. seek out help. And that's something that we haven't done so far. Mm -hmm. And so really looking at how they're marketing this and how um, they could so successful because there was a need and we didn't fill that need and now we are and we're doing it hopefully with the sexual health right. model and a model that's really mm -hmm. um, you know going to help people change and, and express you know their sexual health in a way that you know makes them happier and their partners happier and kind of moves it forward. I think we have to recognize that people, especially around sex, really want simple black and white answers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that part of the issue today is that we're now recognizing sexuality and the modern world of sexuality is not black and white. It's not simple. You know, the, the transgender bathroom bills, you know, are really an expression of people's fear mm -hmm. of the fact that I can't tell if you're a boy or a girl anymore. Um, and I was taught that that matters a lot. And now and it's scary, it's scary yeah. because now the world is not as simple and concrete mm -hmm. as I thought. Yeah. Um, I think, and in places of fear, people want easy, mm -hmm. simple, black and white answers. That's why, you know, demagogues and, you know, political, you know, people can be successful mm -hmm. in those times of fear. Here's the simple answer. I think what we can do well here is we can acknowledge and ally with people's fear we can we can empathize and connect with their mm -hmm. fear and then help to educate them about the things in there that are not so scary and the way that we can improve these things through a greater internal acknowledgement of that struggle and through invoking um sexual health kind of values and attitudes rather than rather than telling people well don't do that um it's less useful in today's world where technology is constantly changing and tomorrow there's another don't do this right. thing and then the day after that there's another thing don't do this yeah. sorry um, to keep up <laughs> exactly you can't keep up but if you are teaching people instead to make decisions from a place of integrity from mm -hmm values we're teaching people to e examine the kind of sexual being they want to be right. as opposed to the kind of sexual behaviors they don't want other people to do yeah. i think now we start to move into a place where we can change this dialogue well said um what was the personal meaning or value that you took away from this begin 
Um, well, this sounds incredibly selfish, but I was just so happy to not be alone. In this <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, as I said at the beginning, if you told me four years ago when I first published the book mm-hmm. and sort of challenging the sex mm-hmm. education industry that something like this would happen, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't have believed you. Yeah. Um, the attacks that I've experienced, you know, the personal, the professional challenges, you know, um, I can't even count the number of times I've been threatened with loss just for questioning and challenging these issues. Um, and for a couple of years, at least, I was all by myself. Um, and I was constantly scratching my head and saying, wow, am I crazy? Am I really an asshole like all these people say that I am because I'm challenging this? Um, the fact now that there is this network, there's this system, there's people like you, there's people like Doug Martin Harvey, Michael Bigelito, Joe Court, all of these people who are coming together now in a synthesis and creating this community now of saying, look, the sex addiction model isn't a good answer anymore. We need better ones. We need ones that are more adaptable to the modern world um, is incredibly powerful because now I now I don't have to worry so much that it's just me being narcissistic or arrogant or um, and frankly I've got other people like you that I can hide behind um, and let and let other folks go off and you know and challenge you know challenge things and poke the bear um, but ultimately I think that's how change happens you know. I think, you know, there, there's a catalyst and then, you know, slowly, you know, community builds mm-hmm. um, and forces things. I mean, just over the past couple of years, I've seen the sex addiction industry change mm-hmm. significantly. You know, they're now talking about uh, how kink and BDSM and alternative sexualities can be forms of healthy sexuality. They were never talking about that before. They're doing so now because this growing community and social values are changing around sex. They're forcing them to now consider and adapt their message. Um, as a result, I think now is the time when people like this growing network can get ahead of the curve. Sure. Yeah, it's important for members of ASEX to, and, and really people who practice sex therapy and couples therapy, I mean, all therapists see this issue at one point or another. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it's important for all of us to realize that there are other models out there mm-hmm. and there are other strategies and solutions to be able to help people that are struggling. Yeah. One of the things that I do is, um, you know, I travel the country doing uh, trainings for therapists um, around modern sexuality and addressing these issues. And, you know, fewer than 5% of therapists typically have training in sexuality issues. Um, even though sex is kind of an important issue. That's why we made Oh, yeah. the, that's why we made the South of Sexual Health Alliance to train general so therapists, valuable. doctors, and sexual health issues. Because what happens when these kinds of issues walk in the door, therapists just refer them away. Mm-hmm. They refer them to the specialist, which right. is typically sex addiction folks. Um, this now offers, I think, uh, credibility, support, um, uh, a community for those therapists to now keep those patients and, and I think ultimately that, that that is one of the strongest messages that I put out there to those therapists is that yeah. we don't have to treat these sexual behavior problems as though they are somehow unique mm-hmm. that the same therapeutic strategies that can be effective with any behavior problems can be effective here. Things like mindfulness, things like good cognitive behavioral therapies um, are great strategies to address these sexual behavior problems so long as we can teach therapists to um, at least be aware of, mindful, and suspend some of their judgment and bias around these sexual issues so that now they can teach, they, they can treat them as a, just as a behavior issue, just like any other. Um, in the past, that wouldn't have been acceptable, and it frankly, it just wouldn't have even been allowed, partially because of the marketing strength of sex addiction. Um, now, one of the things that I see is, you know, the Affordable Care Act, um, has changed healthcare and changed health insurance. And now lots of these folks who used to go to you know, specialty therapists and pay cash, they've got health insurance that covers mental health issues and they want that therapist to, to treat these issues. Yeah. Um, therapists are hungry for this information. And again, I think now is right now, right now is the time for folks like this kind of growing body, this growing you know, nucleus of, of of sexually informed therapists to start sharing this information and these useful strategies system-wide. Right. 
yeah, we don't want to hold this information as some kind of proprietary knowledge that, you know, I'm privileged to have this right. and no one else can. And so it's really important to, you know, educate all therapists, all professionals that come in contact with a client that's struggling with sexuality mm-hmm. issues so that they can, you know, at least have the wherewithal, the education and knowledge to talk about sex, mm-hmm. much less assess and figure out where that they might even send them. Yeah. One of the things that we did in the Institute you know, during our section was, you know, we talked about how would you talk to, you know, the wife of somebody who's afraid of their uh, husband's sexual behaviors? How would you talk to another colleague who is concerned that their, you know, the patient may be so sex addict? How would you talk to the media? Um, how would you talk to community members? around these issues and I think ultimately one of the most powerful parts of that is to put forth hope that these behavior problems can be managed these behavior problems are not indicative of poor moral or mental health deficits that we can help by using good therapeutic strategies and we don't have to invoke this kind of magical um, demon of sex addiction in order to explain or manage these well, you're definitely making huge strides and changes in the general therapy world with your training. So we appreciate all of the work that you're doing. I'm just lucky to be able to do it. And again, I mean, I'm lucky that, um, that this is happening. Um, that uh, you know, I, th- I think the message is that um, system wide, there is recognition that what we've been doing is working. Um, and, and I'm just one of the many people. You know, so Shaw is another one as another group that is stepping forward in the Southwest sexual health <laughs> and a shop. And, uh, and I think that the, that the message is, you know, it's not about me. And, and I think that that was one of the powerful things I think out of this, out of this institute is that, you know, Doug put this together and he said, um, one of the weaknesses of the sex addiction model was that um, it was very personality driven. It was very charismatic, personality driven, focused on very significant single personality community thought leaders. Um, uh, and that could be strong in some ways, but it's also a significant weakness because then as those, you know, those personalities kind of start to lose touch with the, with, with the zeitgeist, with the community, with the system where things are going, um, the whole thing can fall apart. Um, my job here, I think, is not to, uh, this shouldn't be the David Lay show. And Doug said that, you know, this shouldn't be the Doug Brown Harvey show. Um, this should be our show that is focused on, you know, a model of sexual health. And if we do that, then, you know, if, if, if there's a disagreement between me and Doug or me and you around what is sexually healthy, um, that's a good conversation to have. Absolutely. And it shouldn't be answered by who's right and who's wrong. Um, it's not black and white. That's right. <laughs> it invites us to explore those things. Um, I think that was one of the really unique things out of this that um, is different from the whole sex addiction industry um, and history, and I think is a positive thing for us to explore. Sure. Well, it sounds like you kind of answered a little bit of this last question of how did this summer institute change the dialogue, or influence the dialogue moving forward? I think that, you know. One of the biggest things was that I saw people being willing to say that they needed to change. Um, I, you know, again, I mean, that is something I never expected to see, but there were multiple therapists there who, you know, came from a sex addiction background who were certified as sex addiction therapists. And they came out to the community and said, wow, we're now coming out as rejecting sex addiction. As wow, that's and, powerful. And they were talking about their fear of going back to their colleagues and saying, wow, I, I don't think sex addiction is a good or useful model moving forward again. Yeah. I think they could only do so safely by having a connection, by having a community. Um, I, I think the most powerful thing moving forward is that, mm-hmm. that, that there are other folks and that, you know, they've now created some, you know, some internet connections and some Facebook connections where they're sharing information to try to continue keeping this moving forward, not alone. Right. You have the community, you have the support behind you, and so hopefully you can go out in the world and really challenge and really kind of make a difference in terms of what's sexually healthy and what actually helps their clients. Absolutely. I think that 
it takes a village, you know, in so many ways. And I think that as we are, you know, helping people, um, that's one of the things that we can do better together. Um, developing these strategies and thinking, how do I apply a sexual health model to this unique kind of behavior or this unique issue that I had run into before? How do I figure out if that is healthy or not? Um, sometimes that's something that we can answer ourselves and sometimes we need to reach out to our colleagues um, for help. But the most powerful thing I think that moves this dialogue forward now um, is that ASAC you know, recognized this needed to happen. Um, ASECT is no longer offering continuing education units to trainings that involve sex addiction as a model. Um, and that, that starts to change things. It changes things economically. It also changes things now from a credibility perspective because there are sex addiction therapists out there now who think that they are sexually informed and that they are sex positive therapists. But if they're not able to do so with the backing of a group like ASECT, um, that's kind of a powerful challenge. I think that my hope is that this group and this movement moves forward. It shouldn't move forward in order to challenge sex addiction. Instead, it should just move forward in a sexually healthy, sexual wellness model and kind of leave sex addiction behind. Sure. Ultimately, if sex addiction therapists want to be successful, they'll have to follow this model and they'll have to find ways now to integrate and acknowledge sexual health in their trainings and in their therapy. Well, it sounds like certainly a lot is changing and there's a lot more to change in the future. So mm -hmm. thanks so much for giving your perspective. Thank you. I'm glad you're doing this. I think it's, I think it's really wonderful to be able to share this information with the folks who weren't there so that, um, you know, again, this community, this nucleus, this seed can continue to blossom and grow. Right. Support each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.